afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our best practices for achieving shorter unit turnaround time today. This is a Department of Housing and Urban Development training session. I want to welcome all the participants already logged on. We're getting close to 200, pretty good number. And I want you to know that this particular session is number seven out of a series of eight. And what we are discussing today will have a focus on shorter unit turnaround, but this PowerPoint is a building block, therefore reaching back to discussion points and slides that we discussed earlier, just as a refresher and making sure that those that did not have an opportunity to participate in earlier training sessions, that you have the reference and go back to recorded training sessions that are already available on HUD Exchange. So without further ado, next slide, please. Let's start. So the HUD provider TAs, IEM, I welcome Krista, myself, the trainer, Siglinda Chambliss. This is an interactive training session, so please participate. We have polls, ask questions. The learning objectives for today are Participants will understand how to use the PIC system to maximize occupancy and unit categories. You will learn practical strategies to help operations and maintenance teams to detect any issues for faster unit turnaround. And we learn to recognize external factors that can impact unit turnaround and how to use best practice to prepare your team to address them. Now we understand those are unique to different areas and situations. So we did the best to address the most common. And if you have anything to share regarding any of those <clears throat> factors, we welcome your feedback. And of course, uh, share with your team because this is peer to peer learning as well, just as it is hot training. Next slide, please. Some housekeeping rules. We remain muted during the webinar unless you're invited to unmute. Questions can be entered in the Q&A section throughout the presentation. So please make sure that you familiarize yourself with the layout of your screen, find it. We have raising the hand, we have chat, but for questions, we really want you to use Q&A. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the HUD Exchange website at a later date. Next slide, please. All the presentations that we created thus far have a list of abbreviations for you. And this particular PowerPoint, of course, has applicable abbreviations to add to the alphabet soup. Some of them are maybe repetitive from previous presentations, but they are accessible to you. Maybe the recommendation is um, when you have access to those PowerPoint slides, although HUD has on the HUD website a great list of abbreviations. You can take them from the PowerPoint and compile it all in one list. That's just a recommendation. Next slide, please. All right. We have tools that allow us to see status of vacancy. So we will be looking first in the first segment to vacancy tools that we have available. Next slide, please. Of course, if this particular tool is a hot tool, that we are being measured by, and it's important to understand that the measurement or the instructions on how to ensure that we report properly for occupancy, we have to be using the latest PIH notice 2021-35 for unit status category. Why are we highlighting this again? Again, HUD only can see what is being reported through the IMS-PIC or in short PIC information center is being reported. And this is applicable to public housing units. PIC has four main type of categories for occupancy. As a reminder, they are either occupied, vacant, vacant HUD approved, or non-dwelling. Each one of those conditions require a different, they have a different definition on what it means, whether if it's just regular occupied with a lease, that a tenant is occupying on the lease, vacant and HUD approved vacant. There are unique differences between the twos and they are differentiated, of course, also in the subcategories. 
And it's important that we understand when we take advantage of the status reporting for a routine vacant where a lease is being uh, terminated, voluntary termination or um, through the eviction process and the condition of the unit at that time when vacated to determine whether you want to use the vacant status or the vacant hot approved status based on the damages inside the unit. And then the non-dwelling, of course, it's important as well to understand in the public housing arena because anything that is a non-dwelling does not derive operating subsidy and it may be used for other eligible uses that would generate um, operating subsidy, um, but typically those non-dwellings would come back to like community centers and, and buildings like that. Next slide, please. In the accurate pick reporting, we want to make sure that you measure your success based on those occupancy levels. It will tell you the percentages. So when you monitor your pick system and you see from the, from the property management level that you know you have five vacancies, let's say, but in pick you see seven, then obviously there's a reconciliation that needs to take place because some records were either not updated or the update did not take. So it requires frequent reconciliation and ensuring that correct pick data is reported for the occupancy category or subcategory. As a piggyback, I want to say that the table that is in PIH notice 2021-35, you have a very extensive list on the subcategory and we also provide a training particular about pick occupancy and subcategory statuses and what needs to happen in pick that I encourage you to go back and read and make sure that you familiarize yourself with those and also educate your staff. Of course, each one of those has uh, certain operating subsidy levels associated with it. And that's why it is imperative that this is sensitive in nature where you not only have rent loss, you could also experience operating subsidy loss as a result of not properly reporting in the PIC system. <clears throat> Typically, the benchmark would say we want you to be at 97% occupancy rate with a 3% vacancy rate that essentially would achieve at the authority level that you have 100% funding at the subsidy level. So those are the, the parameters for funding levels to keep in mind when we talk about occupancy and funding. Operating subsidy is highly sensitive to occupancy data information and of course the associated vacancy rate. As a reminder again, any data in PIC reported, those are key indicators or key requirements on the HUD. Well, HUD uses those and measures for mass scoring and CFP metric. This also was discussed in detail in previous earlier training sessions. Again, you want to make sure that you familiarize yourself with those and how they can impact your property based on the occupancy data reported. Know that low scores have negative impacts and it, of course always affect funding and some can trigger hot oversight. Now I want to say here that with low scores there is a hot dashboard out there for public housing and you can measure yourself against other housing authorities by just pulling up the link to the dashboard, which is a national dashboard, it's available. And you can see where you're actually scoring in relationship to other housing authorities, whether in your area, based on your size and things like that, you can filter and see where you fall out. The hot KPI or key performance indicator, they want you to be at least at the 95 to 96% range for those housing authorities that are around those thresholds, you will always experience emails most likely from your local HUD office where they say, well, give me information, what's going on, why? Because HUD DC has a need, again, all driven through the national dashboard, what is going on with certain housing authorities that are not meeting the KPIs, key performance indicators. Next slide, please. 
in PIC when you have those uh, matters where you require HUD approval. We go in in PIC and we have images on the next slide so you can see at least what it would look like when you log on. You would select your development from the sub module from the left side of the main page. You have drop downs available. You should only see your properties, of course. You select your field office and the physical development that you wish to designate. There is a unit tab available for you. And again, this is just refresher, just highlight. And you select the unit number. And then you would like to add the designation. And next to the unit designation, there is um, uh, there's a, a blue field. It says modified button. Next slide, please. It would, here's the visual. You can see where unit numbers are on the left. Anything that is blue and highlighted with an underline means it's something that you can drill into. Once you drill into, you got more fields opening up and then you will be able, and you see on the right hand side, edit. You also see up at the top, those header tabs. And you see where we said in the previous slide, you would select unit. In the middle of that slide, you see, of course, which field office and uh, the hub and your uh, field office, um, housing authority name and selecting the uh, development that you want to see. So this is an example, but HUD has published a very well thick uh, manual. I say thick because it's always a good read, you know, with uh, lots of visuals where you can step by step be walked through on how to do certain things. So you want to make sure that if you don't have that, you go out to the HUD website and you look for the pick manual. You just Google, Google, give me pick manual, and it will pop up and direct you most likely to the HUD webpage. And you want to save that in your favorites. Next page, please. HUD user approval in pick. Here we have um, how, to, uh, how to obtain that. You see again, the unit tab is highlighted. You see on the left-hand side, unit number. Sometimes they have door numbers, bedroom counts. Here you can always double check, hey, is this information correct? Because don't be surprised, sometimes depending on the setup, a person sees this and flies over the data and later realizes when they look more closely, oh, wait a minute, this is actually not a one bedroom, this is a two bedroom. So don't be surprised, things can happen. And it's very likely that uh, somebody may not, when they originally set it up and they made a key punch error, that nobody goes through and does a certain QC. So always make sure that you really pay attention to what you see on the screen. On the right hand side, you see on that picture, we have building, entrance address, even addresses. Addresses can be wrong too, so please make sure you pay attention to that. Uh, later on, this all becomes relevant if you ever consider asset repositioning and it's being reconciled and things don't line up. So it's all important. You also see the ACC indicator change date on the bottom, the last time that it was done, and whether it's subject to an operating fund indicator, meaning subject to operating fund rules, ACC annual contribution contract. So just to highlight, like I said, we had a very extensive session on that particular how to do and more detail and information. This is a highlight. Next slide, please. We have pick updates and approvals. So the protocol for requesting a unit status change for those that may not have seen the detailed presentation, just as a reminder, you submit a written request to the hot field office. It's typically written to the director or designee. You explain the reason for the change provide a schedule for placing unit back online into occupied assistant tenant status. Why? Those are typical questions that are being asked to conform to what, when, where, why, how that we want to address in detail. Provide all required documentation for the requested change and then scan or email documents to the field office. 
I also see very often that field office requires the recommended um, statute language in the in the policies and procedures from HUD that are being published. And it's always good to say reference uh, CFR this paragraph under this particular paragraph. I seek the uh, exemption or the approval for. So it's always good to provide the regulatory requirement language associated with your change request. So it's easy to see whether you are able to conform or not. What happens after the approval? You receive an approval letter from, to the PHA, and then you, you're usually invited to make the change in PIC. That's the letter you want. You also want to make sure that when you have that approval letter, it is the HUD's expectation that you actually save them and know your expiration periods. And we want to make sure that somebody in your, on your team or in the office actually knows when those things are expiring because HUD will not warn you there is an expiration coming up on a special condition approval and uh, you need to give us an update on it. So that's something that housing authorities are responsible on doing and maintaining. So you want to have it in a folder where you know it's subject to time requirements that you adhere to those and proactively seek additional extensions. System automatically generates an email to the field office once you enter the change. And if done prior to the approval letter, the request will be most likely rejected or they ask you to take it up because you did not have the invitation. It really depends who you work with, if they do or not, but that's a recommended process. And then, of course, as I said, you need to be responsible for sending any renewal notifications in. So you need to understand your expiration dates. Want to pause a little bit? I saw a little bit chat activity. Do we have a question, Helena? Or we're good for right now? Move on to the next slide. I think we're good for right now. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Next slide, please. All right. So we're diving into unit status category. Next slide, please. So in the 2021-35 PIH notice. Uh, what is vacant and hot approved? So we're making a unique distinction between the two and highlight the vacant unoccupied dwelling units that do not house families and um, participating in a public housing program or do not fit in any of the hot approved vacancy subcategory status. So that's just a regular vacant unit. That's the definition. Hot approved vacant means a unit that requires the housing authority to request an approval letter from the hot field office. Now, what are these? These are potentially, for the most part, undergoing modernization or substantial rehab activity due to uh, really bad uh, turnover um, conditions when the family left the unit that or it was aged enough and you waited for that moment and you knew that upon vacancy you were going to modernize or upgrade the particular unit but for no particular reason it could be vacated and wasn't under a routine uh, turnaround schedule didn't know the condition which just came out of COVID it took a little time more time to assess what is happening and it's determined funds are available, it's time to just uh, rehab the particular unit. Or more recently, as we are experiences, experiencing, we are affecting by, affected by disaster. So in that, in that particular case, uh, it can hit you at any time. And uh, for that particular reason, for sure, you want to make sure that you immediately start your process on the PIH notice 2021-35 and request hot approved vacant status because it will take you long a longer period of time than just routine vacancy turn to get that unit back online. So it's just a reminder that we can't list all, but these are the most typical activities that or causes that can occur. Next slide, please. So, Trevor, we do have a question mm -hmm. here that I'm hoping you can maybe address. 
Sure. So an individual submitted a question. Uh, we've got a couple popping in here. Let's go through these quickly. <laughs> so the first one um, is the is the op fund and cap fund indicator as shown in PIC being entered by a PHA or are they de default status based on occupancy status? Uh, well, actually, it depends on your AMP. So when you initially um, had public housing units way back then in the 30s and 40s, an AMP, a project was established. And when it's 100%, of course, uh, subject to 100% ACC, then all of it is subject to operating uh, fund rule as well as the capital fund rule because capital funds are associated to any ACC unit. It's different in a mixed finance status when we started with the HOPE 6s. When the HOPE 6 uh, grants were introduced and we actually did asset reposition, a new word that uh, we used for way back then activity on the HOPE 6, we just called it revitalization. We took 100% uh, ACC units and converted them to something else. We redeveloped them and some ACC units landed in the income mix of that particular property. And it had a new AMP number, as we know, project number. And those are exempted in the system, but they're not exempted from REACT. So it's important to understand they are exempted from the scoring, but they're not exempted for REACT because they have public housing units in there. So I hope that kind of helps address the question. Thanks. And then there was one other question is someone's asking the difference between a unit status renewal versus an extension. And do they need to be submitted before the approval expires? Um, I treat those two words the same meaning. So a renewal or an extension is the same thing. Sometimes, and I say this, you might be able to use an example of supply chain interruption, especially during COVID and after COVID, and we're still feeling it or in the, in the event of disaster. Having access to supplies may require that we are seeking an extension or a continuation renewal of an existing condition that HUD would have expected to bring to closure and actually house a family in that unit. So I treat them the same tomato, tomato. And the second part, I'm sorry, Helena. Um, the second part of the question was, do they need to be submitted before the approval expires? I would do that. Um, the reason why I say I would do that and not wait for the expiration, because one, it's about preparedness and you knowing your inventory and you knowing that you're responsible for requesting. So why would you wait until something lapses that it's harder to explain that you missed a deadline? Human error can occur, but you want to really do this at least uh, 30 to 60 days in advance, especially when you know you will not meet the deadline for the approval letter of whatever conditions were placed upon you to bring it to online status. So you do want to be proactive and do that. And of course, it adds to uh, credibility as well that you know what you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, there's someone else chiming in here. The um, PAH notice 2011-35 notes that they should request the renewal before it expires or at least within 30 days. Otherwise, the unit will need to be reverted to vacant for a period of time. Right, right. And of course, this particular 2011 was replaced by 2021. So please make sure as uh, you know, you're using these documents, you always use the most latest uh, document since language adds or uh, HUD expounds on the uh, particular area. So it's 2021-35. All right, causes for vacancy for or HUD approved vacancies. No really particular reason. We know tenants have choices and sometimes they have changes and sometimes they just don't like the community anymore. Uh, property does not match the tenants need. Uh, there may be things happening within the inside of the family nucleus where their needs within the community or of that unit cannot be met and the unit turns. There could be job loss in the area, and we discussed this, especially in very rural areas where industry just leaves the area. And then with that, it makes it no longer desirable 
for the, the family, the tenants to be in that particular area because there's no advancement. The, the housing where the, 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 the job is located is too far away, struggle with transportation needs. Uh, you know, we make decisions based on well, when the gas price goes up, you, you may want to reevaluate where you want to live, even your personal choice. So the same happens with families. The property is aged. It no longer really is conducive to living there. And uh, we haven't, as an authority, maybe modernized taking care of the property, and therefore it becomes undesirable. There's severe damage or abuse or deferred maintenance. Again, it depends on the readiness of the housing authority or the management agent that manages maybe the property for us that we make sure that uh, we always provide decent and health and safe, um, healthy and safe housing for our tenants that includes, of course, the maintenance requirements. The property could be considered or deemed obsolete. I had mentioned earlier Hope 6 that tells you, uh, you know, I've been around in that field a little bit, but also uh, we migrated the Hope 6s to what is called the CNI, or the Choice Neighborhood Initiatives. So conversions are being done or redevelopment activities through CNI, for example, applying for that particular grant and do broader, not just footprint, uh, redevelopment, but broader community. Uh, there is the rental assistance demonstration program that we've been talking about, and we also had a webinar on that and discussed it a little bit more in detail when we can use that. And we go through asset reposition. That's a term used very commonly on the rental demonstration program, and we do those conversions. So Vacancy can occur because maybe participants feel like, well, I, I really don't want to uh, participate in that kind of program, although I like the, maybe the flexibility of having a voucher after a year or two, but I'm really not liking it compared to public housing. Then, of course, major repairs from other damages, uh, which, could, which could be lingering or, long, or just long term or, again, readiness, how long it takes for your maintenance team to manage and take care of water leaks and plumbing issues with aging, aging property. And then, of course, the most severe that we have to be concerned with is the disaster that essentially really severely damages or destroys the property. Next slide, please. Sorry, is there sort of an industry standard in terms of... Um an acceptable number of days for a unit to remain vacant under normal unit turnaround? Well, so let me give you this one. When uh, research is conducted and you look at a private management firm, uh, we use the five finger method. I, I say this simple, but uh, it's usually said every unit that is not occupied one on the on the market market, when we look about real market um, housing, you do not want a unit vacant. Every unit vacant does not draw revenue. Revenue not brought in cannot cover expenses. So therefore we use finger method, uh, one bedroom, one day, maximum maybe two, it should not take much. Uh, two bedroom, two days, maybe three. A three bedroom, three days, four bedroom, four days, and five bedroom, five days. So I think we have maybe six maximum in public housing. But typically, we would use the hand method to count down how many bedroom size per day. So one one bedroom per day. But again, it depends on the severity of the damages, where you need to make an allowance or a condition. Uh, going anything going over thirty days is definitely not a good thing for a routine turn. You definitely have issues. I would say for us in public housing, a good standard. Maybe depending on maintenance availability and how many units are vacant for that particular month, maybe seven to 10 days at most. That should be a good benchmark to allow you to review your processes to see if anything happened to why the unit cannot be occupied faster. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Operational challenges with vacant units or hot approved vacancies. So. Some of those things I kind of uh, addressed through the, the question that came up. Uh, lack of management reports. If we don't have management reports, we don't know what's going on. So that's big picture, uh, executive team, leadership, uh, asset management director, 
and property managers, if we don't know what's vacant that day or understand vacancy cycles uh, based on lease dates, then we have a problem because you literally have to do this manually and just be really in tune or rely on somebody's intuition to see what's happening. So focus on management reports that give you clear and concise data. Not reviewing your work orders or understanding operating the repeating operating issues. You, you work orders, if you study them, they tell you a lot. They tell you how much time is spent in a unit on what problem, what problem occurs more often, more frequent. You should be able to extract the report that says, give me a work order report that use all the categories for plumbing. And if the plumbing is going from the top floor to the bottom floor, then you know you probably need to look and evaluate your system because something is happening. So work order reports are a very good indicator and you want to look in your software to see what kind of indicators you're using, maybe groupings, I call them groupings, or short descriptions that allow you to filter a report. Not communicating among departments. So where do we not experience that? So that's not unusual, but we are so busy. Uh, we can't rely on emails, the written. I think we need to ensure that we have uh, touch time, at least on a maybe weekly basis, bi-weekly basis, and talk within the, the departments. Departments, I mean, uh, if you have a very well-organized finance department, they will tell you what's happening with the money. If you have a very well organized um, uh, maintenance shop, there is communication on, hey, I'm spending way too much time on X. Uh, if property managers get together and say, hey, I'm experiencing this, do you experience the same? You know, drawing on those conclusions and meeting and talking amongst departments, more brains together will solve the problem or will help you at least understand what's happening. Not managing a centralized wait list. I don't wanna say necessary just centralized wait list or not maintaining a wait list at all because some could be property wait list, especially after the hope sixes when the concept was introduced when we did redevelopment or new AMs that it had its own wait list. Just make sure that who is really responsible in overseeing wait lists in general, wasting the time and not understanding your wait list, not purging in it, not making it. Uh, more up to date and current to allow you to draw from a wait list can really, really delay your reoccupancy of a vacant unit. So think about who does that in your shop today and what are your strategies to continue keeping that list fresh? We don't want to do this on an annual basis. When you know you attrit five units every month, you should be able to draw five, 10, fresh, clean names off your wait list, because not everybody that you pull off the wait list will take the unit. So spend some time in evaluating and process flow your wait list process. Not understanding the month, the number of monthly average unit turns. So we talked about that earlier, what should be the standard? I think every housing authority need to set the benchmark as a goal and maybe think about how you want to reward when goals are being met, but you do want to have that goal, staff needs to understand and understand the bigger picture, no revenue brought in does not cover operating expenses. So when we want raises, when we want to have incentive payments, when we want to have training, you know, that's something transferable as far as communication to make understand on the whole team that we all need to pull together. This is teamwork. We need most likely a scope of work when there is more work that has to be actually performed inside the unit. And it's not just about the maintenance team doing it, but you need to now put out a bid or an RFP for something that you see is a generic issue. And you need to broaden the scope and bring an expert in to help you and get it done faster. Or when you experience uh, exodus and maintenance team members because uh, potentially they go off the market and for for 50 cents more leave your environment and work for somebody else. So there could be maintenance staff shortage as well or not experienced staff. 
where you're just unable to maintain uh, the activity and you need to rely on a bid or a scope. So you need to have somebody that can help formulate that. It could have derived from deferred maintenance as part of uh, lack of maintenance uh, workers or not having your funding resources available to cause that issue or for the sheer fact that you do not have a maintenance plan. So, you know, there we do need to spend time and understand what should be routinely reviewed and maintained on an ongoing basis that generated a lot of these work orders. We may need to expand on that list because we see it and it could be very costly. So spend a good amount of time developing and formulating the routine maintenance plan. Everything that I'm talking about today, those lists already exist. Some samples already are out there on the World Wide Web that you can actually obtain and refine and make it your own and customize to your agency. And then, of course, you got these modernization rehab activities um, that does not currently have a contractor, but you need them, you need quotes, you need an RFP or bids, as I have stated, and you want to make sure that you, we used to talk under the capital fund uh, program, what do we have a modernization plan? Well, how do we get to the five-year plan? So it really starts with the maintenance section, listening to your tenants and your maintenance plan, the observations through the work orders on where we potentially need to plan funds out and what we need to plan for so you can work with your procurement department and actually execute these documents more timely. Just know anytime you make procurement, it really takes three to five months because it takes time to advertise. It takes time to write the scope. It takes time to make sure that all the information is properly adequately covered so you can actually get to a good bid sheet and so forth. You need sometimes coordination with an architect. So all of that needs to be taken in consideration. So maybe I want to say three to six months for a active larger procurement. You want to get that time. So planning again is your friend and routinely just evaluate the list to see, hey, do I have everything captured? And of course, vacancies don't bring in enough revenue to maintain the property, as, as I said that before. Next slide, please. I think we have a couple um, comments in here. Uh -huh. One is someone was asking for some examples of what you would consider sort of routine maintenance for a vacancy. Um, we actually have that in the PowerPoint, so I'm not going to get ahead of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other person's um, going back to a pre <laughs> Uh, good, the, good. There was another comment here about um, from a previous training, we stated the number of vacant units eligible for operating subsidy must not be more than 3% of the total units on a project by project basis. And they're just asking if this is a requirement or a best, best practice because they were not able to locate the regulation um, regarding that particular item. Okay, so you're not going to have that in writing. But when you talk to a fiscal person, we know you are going to, HUD gives you on the operating subsidy, it's, it's like built in into the formula for a 3% vacancy, okay? If you maintain 97% occupancy and add the 3%, you're at your 100% funding. So do it by deduction. You're not gonna get that in writing, okay? So that's a fiscal approach. And that's why we always say when budgeting time comes up, okay, what's your vacancy goal? Okay, we know HUD's um, prescribed uh, vacancy 3% in the scoring. So we wanna make sure uh, because it affects your scoring. You know, when you have, when you look at your mass score for vacancy and you look at that, scoring affects your funding. Lack of funding, financial challenges with vacant units or HUD approved vacancies. So occupancy does affect funding. The annual plan or otherwise, where they don't have documentation that action was included in the capital fund submission for discussion at the annual public hearing, which is a requirement on the 24 CFR Code of Federal Regulation, um, the uh, excerpt is on the 905-300 we want to read. 
we want to make sure that we have our needs addressed when we do bidding and we are using capital funds that a public hearing was done the project is planned for other than emergency and we know when disaster occurs you can immediately uh, put that into action and revise it in your five-year plan under the emergency rule, but you have to make sure that you're sensitive and cognizant of the fact that you have to conform to the public hearing requirements. You have to make it as a regular routine project. It has to conform to the rule. And qualified PHAs not using capital funds for modernization must provide documentation that the action was included in the five-year plan, and that is on the 903.3 paragraph C for the definition of qualified PHAs. So we just want to make sure that, yes, there can be financial hurdles when it comes to those. Planning is always um, encouraged and recommended, highly recommended, I say, that you do that and review prior to the submission, uh, you actually conform to this particular requirement. Next slide, please. Administrative challenges. Administrative challenges with vacant units or HUD approved vacants can include, uh, I, I alluded to that, uh, your procurement timing. I said three to six months, it depends on the type of procurement and the complexity of the procurement, but you have to plan for that. The issue of vendor supply, vendors in general and supplies, I alluded to that earlier, coming out of COVID, we definitely experienced uh, vendor issues and supply issues, but also still significantly supply issues. And when you're in a disastrous area, supply issues are going to continue or even vendors because they may be stretched based on the amount of jobs that are handling for you or the area. The poor coordination amongst the staff and tasks and timelines, and that's why it's important that when you have the management reports and you see something happening, that you begin address those pain points. See it not as a negative, see it as a positive to say, where do I have opportunity to improve? What can I do to ensure that? So it's those kind of statements and phrases to put it in a more positive aspect and engage with your team to allow for positive feedback or constructive feedback to say, no, I experience that all the time. Let's pay attention and begin to listen to those particular concerns. Poor waitlist management. We talked earlier about wait, uh, waitlist in general. We do not want to wait a year or five years down the road to purge it. It's no longer relevant. It's no longer applicable. And of course, any checks, uh, lack of checklists. Checklists are good. Checklists keep me organized. You know, there's nothing wrong with checklists. We, I know we are not robots and we're not trying to teach staff to become robots. But what we want to do is when it's important to us, give us a little support and give us a checklist to say, have I done everything that uh, I could have done and help the staff that they can feel good about themselves having achieved what I needed to get done to address a certain problem. And checklists are a great support and help with that. Not everybody learns the same way. Not everybody works the same way. So whatever makes it work, use it. If you're in one of those cities that are subject to union contracts and um, negotiations, please make sure that you understand you will have uh, delays and time issues uh, regarding that because staff could be on strike, they could not be working, it could be um, cost prohibitive uh, to continue on maybe with the recommendations that they're doing and negotiations can really put a, a, a bite or really slow you down as far as unit turns because staff will not be working. So you just want to be aware when that happens. And any time timelines can affect by can be affected by lack of funding. If funding is not there, that's a different hurdle that requires a different brainstorming session that requires a different approach. 
uh, when funding is not aware, uh, available because of reserves aren't there, the operating funds are not there, the capital funds are not there, and you just need to have a different strategy. So that's a whole nother basket of issues that can be completely addressed separately, but we did have a, a webinar on that, on how to even get through the asset repositioning approach. Next so slide. I just want to jump in real quick. I uh -huh. see um, Brian McGrady from HUD has provided here in the chat mm -hmm. the um, CFR regarding that 3% um, piece that we were discussing earlier. Put a bad I don't know, Brian, if, you wanna, if you're able to unmute and chime in a little more um, or if you have anything else to add, there was a follow-up question to your, um, your CFR notice comment here. Um, right, because the 3% is written in the rule, but the vacancy... Uh, you know, KPI is different as I alluded to earlier, but it's it's a benchmark between the 97 and the three. So yeah, if we can have hard to expound, that would be helpful. Putting you on the spot, Brian, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all good, all peer to peer. Are we able to unmute him? Think I can try. I don't have control, unfortunately. Can Brian unmute himself, Krista? If not, that's okay. We come back. And... Yeah, no, I'm not, I just tried it. I'm not able to unmute anybody. So oh, okay. Be... No, no problem. Could be a setting issue. But as long as we have the written reference, we are good. Next slide, please. Disaster, <clears throat> disaster challenges. So you saw financial challenges, admin challenges, disaster challenges. Just in general, restoring units to the original condition can be a challenge because sometimes we have to say original condition because sometimes we have, uh, especially when you have a public housing unit in a mixed income community, investors and lenders have the requirement that the unit must be restored in its original condition. And if that happens, then you have to conform and you have to be able to demonstrate that that was met. Not understanding insurance, uh, insurance coverage or requirements. So even for insurance purposes, sometimes when you have a disaster, the insurance due to depreciation and just the age of the property uh, and deductible, depending on what insurance package was negotiated to keep price down, can affect the amount of funds that you receive back that you have. And then you need to be able to fill that gap somehow if FEMA is not present, because it's not necessarily always associated with the FEMA activity for federal assistance to fill the gap. Uh, lack of a justice report to seek further federal assistance. If the insurance adjuster does not come out timely or does not come out or uh, writes poor reports, it can affect your, um, your, your results of actually being able to seek uh, further federal assistance for any of the damages. So you want to make sure that you have somebody on the team that actually kind of focuses on that or you have an expert that helps you navigate through those issues. Identifying your projects for hardening and mitigation. I say this because FEMA does have mitigation uh, and hardening. Hardening meaning always make it better than what it was before. The best example is from a shingle roof to a metal roof when you have high winds and hurricanes. So that's just the best example that I have in this particular case. Then there, FEMA has a mitigation team where you can discuss those kind of items and say, what is it do I, that I need to do in order to conform so I will qualify for this particular grant? Because usually your block grants that you have, CDBG, the DR or MIT, there are specific grants that have a dash, CDBG dash MIT, CDBG dash DR disaster recovery. They have specific requirements that are laid out in, with the goal in mind that you are improving the property in better condition than it was before, and it's mitigating or protecting against future damages. So that's what that means. Uh, making ne necessary repairs to stop further damage is always the first 90 days. What have you done to stop the bleed? And then, of course, 
as I mentioned earlier, the insurance adjuster not coming out, not timely enough, or not just in general understanding how it all works together between FEMA, the state and local government and your city on where you need to be. All I can say is HUD, HUD Exchange also has a webinar that uh, was created on the IEM where we discussed the uh, emergency and disaster in specific, and we have provided uh, ample of tips and tools to help us navigate through what to know about. And depending on what state and city you are, you learn about who those individuals are. They can help you in an emergency emergency management disaster environment and that your executive director or somebody on your team actually is included and sits at the table and is informed and be able to immediately act upon any of those disaster challenges that you may experience. So it's very important. I know it's a lot of information, but the training is out there. The information is out there. FEMA has a plethora of wealth of knowledge information already published. Emergency management systems are out there. It's all it's all out there, but there is a hot exchange training that kind of organized it together for you to learn more about how to prepare. Okay. Next slide, please. Yay, we are at the first poll. All right. So now we need you to help us understand. And these are very simple yes, no questions, one minute limit. All you have to do is fill in the bubble, yes or no. First question, are you comfortable with changing unit categories and subcategories in PIC? Just a yes, no. We just wanna quantify. Are you experienced challenges at the operational level with vacancies? It's just a yes, no. It's all secret. Nobody sees your answer, who gave the answer? We just see the results of that. Are you experiencing challenges fiscally to address your unit turns? Yes or no? Do you know? If you don't know, that's fine. Uh, just uh, don't select the bottle, bubble or select no. Have you been impacted by disaster? So these are just yes, no survey questions that we want to understand uh, how it affects you. We got three seconds. Come on, come on, come on. One minute gone. All right. So. Shortly, we will have the results. All right. So first question, a uh, little bit of the population has an issue. So not, not very much. So that's good. I gave you tips on where to go out there. Go get your pick manual. Talk to your pick coach. Uh, have a conversation. If somebody else in your organization knows more about it, learn together as a team on how to do this well. Okay. Are you experiencing those challenges at the operational level? Uh, a little bit. So um, we have a lot of individuals not answered. So if you don't know, that's fine too. But just know, have a conversation. Those additional tips that we're going to give you, give you a lot of brainstorming uh, work to consider what to look for and how to prepare. And the last uh, question, uh, not the last question, but uh, question number three, uh, small amount, 1% and have you been impacted by disaster? So no, so hopefully this will be all good, uh, helpful tips for you that you can put in your library in case it does occur. All right, so we're gonna pause just a second. Any follow-up questions before we go into the next segment? I'm not seeing anything new in the chat here. Awesome, awesome, moving on. Thank you very much. Any, do we want to pause and somebody wants to add something to the information and wants to share with the peers before we start factors impacting unit turnover time? I just want to throw it out there. These are your peers. Do not be afraid. This is peer-to-peer -peer session. We're learning together. If not, moving right on. Next slide, please. All right. The pass, the pass score. So conditions and unit turn time. The pass score does is affected when you are unable to turn your units. And we talked about best practices, what could be a good benchmark. But when we know we don't have a preventative maintenance plan uh, for units that are deteriorating, that's a problem. Uh, 
deteriorated units also lead to many work orders. That slows you down. Work orders are costly because we have not addressed root causes. So we can learn about categorization of work orders and reading the work order report. Deteriorated units, this is all cause and effect and linkages have a long lead time for unit terms, uh, unit terms because certain supplies may not be available because we have not paid attention or uh, the material in general for an H property has aged out and your maintenance staff has to cobble it together from other pieces and build that particular piece that you may need. Any unit turn does not provide, any unit not turn does not provide the housing, first of all, and of course the necessary uh, revenue and these unit turn times that take longer affect our occupancy percentage, which affect our score. So we have to make sure that we fully understand cause and effects. Next slide. On the physical condition of past score, uh, of course, when we have low scores, we know we need more dollars. You know, I, I put the big blob of money in the middle, but you know, I don't want to say everything is driven around the money, but money is a big factor. When we have lower scores, typically it's a result of uh, not having enough resources to maybe even address the issues. And we need to make sure that the project is a qualified project in the five-year capital fund program that it conform to all the requirements. Uh, vacant units draw, draw no rent and cannot help with operating expenses as well, as well as uh, occupancy rate does affect the operating subsidy. When we develop the operating subsidy requests in February to receive our funding levels in March, and uh, you know those those vacancies uh, when when they have not been put in proper categories can significantly affect your funding levels. And of course, we know that if we don't have those uh, funding levels available or any other capital fund grant programs that maybe HUD will have out there to apply for under the competitive rule, then we don't have funds to cure any of those deficiencies. So that becomes, as I have said earlier. In another conversation on the last piece on that error that we saw on that slide, it becomes a larger conversation than on asset reposition or how we get to modernization of a particular age development. Next slide, please. External factors that affect our unit turnarounds. Um, those are specific to um, move out inspections or move inspections in general. So, we we need to do uh, HQS inspection or inspection in general that the, the unit is ready to move in. Uh, pest control can affect your unit turnaround, uh, not having the unit ready because of some very uh, pesty uh, things lingering around that just don't want to die, I guess, in the unit or mo keep multiplying that should not be there. So you want to make sure you have a very robust, strong, a uh, pest control contract and have a good discussion, not just with the contractor, but also with the tenant, if they are uh, contributing to the issue, uh, the quality of the work order not being ready to move somebody in because the, the, the quality of work did not allow us to actually approve upon inspection to move anybody in because there's something missing, especially when the stove is not working or uh, lights covers are not done on the electrical outlets and things like that that could be health and safety related maybe uh, access to supplies and materials we talked about that but again it's really affecting your turnaround how long it takes and you may not be in an area where you have quick delivery of something and you need to do better uh, planning on anticipation that it takes a week to get certain items or two weeks you know who knows uh, of course, the scope of work for procurement and the procurement process that we addressed earlier and responses from contractors. Now, this is what I'm going to give you on contractors. Sometimes contractors will just purely say, I'm not doing business with the housing authority for one or another reason. They're slow in the bills. They want too much. There are too many papers. I don't want to deal with it. All I can tell you there is, yes, all valid concerns. 
could be valid concerns, but this is what we can do. Continue to do your vendor outreach, continue to do education with the vendor, continue to have discussion in your back office procurement and finance and streamline processes. Change the narrative, change the projection of perception of your organization. Make, have those meetings, have those tough uh, meetings, just like tenant meetings, you know, listen to the concern of the contractor and see within the uh, regulation what can be done to help simplify and explain why certain things have to be done, including uh, Davis-Bacon, uh, made section three, uh, any of those other things, why insurance coverage, where you can bend, uh, just explain and uh, help them understand to overcome and provide training. You know, not everybody is equipped to handle, to fill out hot forms. Sometimes we can have a training session and say, let us come in today. Today we're learning about how we're going to fill out properly for, for this. And uh, what is considered a, a good proposal? Why did you not win the proposal? What else do you need to do the next time? So have those vendor outreach discussions, have those training sessions. It goes a long way and will improve the, the, the conversation and potentially having more quotes for you. And, and sometimes it's just the procurement um, handbook that you're using that makes it a little bit uh, harder. You could potentially go to quotes instead of having an RFP or a closed bid. So you just need to look at those kind of factors. Next slide, please. Local market factors on vacancies. So we talked a little bit and there is a discussion uh, very much on rule, which was in the past two presentations. And we talked about it, rural areas or areas where industry just scales back and you have an economic opportunity scale back because it does not long it does no longer exist for the market in your area and then when that happens of course that affects a whole bunch of other things such as not just the housing but also the uh, the availability of qualified staff and and having your succession planning in place to fill backfill positions. As a result of economic opportunity or lack of opportunity, we should say, uh, when the industry scales back, uh, it leads to usually an exodus of individuals and, and individuals, tenants, families, they have children. And when children are no longer there that need to be schooled, schools are gonna be less, they will be closing, they will be consolidating. It makes it harder to get to a certain area to give your child a good education. Transportation can be scarce and absent because uh, some areas have not been able to get public transportation off the ground for what or not, one or another reason. And, uh, you know, carpooling may not be able to exist or it may not be feasible for the individual to work for you. And you may need to consider having them, if you're paperless, if you can, work them from home to achieve what you need to have addressed. But sometimes in our industry, that's just not feasible. So with that, job opportunities uh, could be closing down or are very limited. As we talked before, vendors and supplies, vendors will not go out in rural areas where they cannot uh, have the sales of their materials. They will go to locations where they can achieve their bottom line and they have investors and they're on the stock market. They want to have profits. So uh, that could be uh, something missing in your area where you have to come up with different avenues and you may need to pool maybe with another authority together just to be able to uh, you know, get on the purchasing power on um, pooling purchases together and make it worthwhile for the supplier to consider delivering to your area. But also in your area, you could not be a deemed an opportunity zone. So know and be aware of that uh, that can impact you. We talked about the rural and economic development initiatives. If these are not uh, identified for your area, they uh, affect growth opportunity in your area. And uh, with that, just all these other uh, icons that we looked at here uh, are affected by how your area is 
uh, classified for economic growth and of course uh, being more prone uh, for disaster because uh, we know tornadoes and tornado alley that they're going to happen so uh, certain things flooding they were going to happen uh, but others uh, with today's climate change we don't know and you can be affected and we just want to make sure that you know that can affect your scoring and your uh, housing of individuals so just know that uh, is something to you prepare the best that you can next slide please hey sig i there aren't really questions per se but there's a lot of chatter in the uh -huh. um chat box about folks just kind of expressing and sharing mm -hmm. their um experiences more recently especially with folks really leaving units in, in poor condition, you know, um, mm -hmm. vacating and leaving a lot of personal items and furniture, you know, extensive damage, especially mm -hmm. folks who are, um, have been terminated. Um, you know, uh, do you have any, any thoughts or comments about that? I know it's not necessarily um, specifically in this wheelhouse of the topic here, but, you know, lots of conversation about just um, the How best practice of having you know, get a unit as quickly with that? as possible. Yeah, it's, it, they're up against a lot of challenges in that regard. Uh, that is true. And I, I think I have to say as a first comment, get with your lawyer. What are you legally allowed to do to take possession of a unit? And PIH notice 2021-35 did address um, uh, also some legality because we know that the key is taking pos possession of the unit. And if the key, if the key has not been returned and there are possessions in there, and we don't know if the unit is abandoned, we, we have to understand those factors. So I'm going to go the legal route first as your best defense mechanism to understand how to deal with it. If you do not have in house legal assistance or support, then work with those that uh, help you through any legal issues that you have to set a standard. For you and your staff, so they understand how to deal with certain situations. And if it doesn't fit, fit the checklist on the process flow for yes, no answers, I would develop a chart like that. Then have a conversation to say, can we actually take the unit or not? And so when keys are left behind, it's easy. Right, because then it's your unit, they leave it in there, you have possession of the unit, you can do with it what you want. But again, I'm referring you to make sure you uh, understand the legal environment so you're not opening yourself up for any litigation. Is that pretty good? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's probably a lot of the commiseration here going on um, and just, you know, acknowledgement of the, the challenges folks are having. Correct. I have a couple of follow up questions that just kind of popped in while you were chat just discussing that. Um, one individual asked if, you know, the resident turns in their keys and items are left behind. Um, can they go ahead and just throw it away or do they have to hold on to those items for 30 days? Um, and then another kind of follow along question, whether or not security deposits can be increased. Um, you know, one is saying that theirs is so low that it really isn't much of um, feeling of incentive for a resident to return a unit in good condition. Right. So I think, um, I mean, I have a, a, a general personal uh, opinion about that, but I would go the legal route to see how well, how you can push it and directly at the operational level with the security deposit. I'm not sure if HUD put a restriction on based on income levels, what you actually can realistically charge to the tenant, uh, considering income limits and, uh, sometimes having, uh, zero renters. So there, I would make sure that you vet that based on your jurisdiction, based on your locality with the appropriate HUD rules and make sure that everybody understands. But I do understand the limitations. So there, as a, as a response, it's almost like when you know you have a lot of zero renters. Well, what am I doing with FSS? Do I have a Ross grant? What do I need to have done to get people to work and generate more income to be able to move ahead or out of public housing to some degree to do better for themselves? So it, it just triggers a different set of questions. Take the opportunity to take a negative and push it into the positive realm of exploring those particular areas instead of just dealing with the problem. 
So that's the best response I can give there. Um, if you have that question still, we will give you an official response. If you write it out at the end of the presentation, we will give you the address where you can mail those questions or you leave them in the Q&A and we will uh, combine them and give you a written response, okay? Just a few other things some folks are sharing and some of their best practices. Um, mm -hmm. Doing um, pre-vacate inspections, you know, yeah. continuing to educate residents um, what is expected at the time of move out, including mm -hmm. potential charges, and then yep. to also keep your maintenance charges updated with local area costs. Yep. All, all good items, and I think we have some of those as well. And you can borrow from the from the uh, from the market. You know how do apartment complexes do that? Have a strong lease. Have a strong lease enforcement. Make it clear. Uh, so those are all all good best practices. I appreciate the feedback. PHA factors affecting vacancies. Uh, we could have over over uh, on the house conditions. Uh, that can affect or impact vacancies and who you can move in. But if you have to split families and um, if they're overhoused and you don't have a vacancy available, uh, then you have to wait for the next opening or find a different solution and or underhoused um, families move out, not knowing and understanding the, the family move, move out schedules, but also uh, not knowing when the lease uh, renews or not have it in a management report to to ask frequent questions. Are you happy in our community? Uh, are you planning on leaving? Uh, just like the, the uh, private market would do. The ac accessibility needs are increasing as we know. And when you know you have an aging population in your community that used to be just all family and then all the family ages in place and now you may have an accessibility need uh, because we have aged out and we need wheelchairs or other, uh, we, we don't have everywhere ramps and everything else. So you need to be a, aware of your family composition and age of composition to make sure that the family needs are addressed proactively. And of course, you always have to address them when the tenant comes to you that says, I have an accessibility need. Because it could be not just to, to say elder population, but it could be a current condition brought upon an accident or whatever that puts them into an accessibility need. Uh, transfers could be requested. How do you deal with them? And, uh, you know, uh, making sure you have a good checklist on when and how transfers are being dealt with. Your normal eviction process, uh, when you know you may have attrition, just like in the voucher program with landlords, as well as your own eviction initiative, and you calculate a monthly average. So you need to prepare for that. Uh, your uh, VAWA program and protection uh, may create a vacancy because you now have to house them someplace else. And that pops up and your all your, of course, health and safety transfers that occurs, especially when it comes through the REACT process, when the unit is being inspected and you now have to deal with that particular issue, it, it affects vacancies. Next slide, please. Detecting other issues. All right. So in your, uh, it was asked, well, what can we do? You know, you definitely can in your maintenance plan and identifying in your, through the inspection report and REACT is the first thing that you can use your delinquency reports that you have, your crime reports uh, that can contribute to vacancies because nobody wants to live in an area uh, prone in crime and can lead to this uh, particular issue. Uh, abandonment of units when you know you are reaching out and annual recertifications are not done, you most likely have silence or in potential abandonment. So more frequent checking on the unit for individuals that you're trying to reach and they just don't come in for what or another reason. You can't just leave it to the back office staff to send notifications. You need eyes on the unit and know, hey, is this unit actually still occupied? Uh, you can have envelope issues. That's the building issues. You can have roof issues. You can have mold. These things should all be kind of 
looked for part of your uh, visual and routine inspection to pay attention to. And you can mark or gear your checklist uh, for those particular items. Next slide, please. Contributing others, we, we've talked about the supplies and materials, not having a stock. Uh, now we know we do not want to go back and have a warehouse situation where we have inventory at the site, but maybe it's a good idea that you always keep uh, one set of appliances available and certain small tools that you know you need. You don't need a large inventory. With having Lowe's HD and HD supply around where they usually can deliver very quickly to you, it's no longer necessary. And again, we are not encouraging to build up inventory, but maybe it makes sense to have definitely one set of appliances or two, depending on the size of your authority, of course, and you have room for those materials where you could readily address uh, some of those issues. Finding the external contractor, we talked about that and what we could do with vendor outreach. The lack of maintenance staff, we talked about that because there could be um, experience level, uh, not having a lot of individuals available to wanting to apply for your positions, and you may have to find alternate ways to do that. Can we go back to that slide, please? The one back. And uh, you may need to partner with uh, with partner with uh, technical colleges and so forth, or uh, temp temp agencies. The length of time to procure the money issue and internal quality of uh, maintenance to not just get in the unit to pass inspection. So this is just highlight, and they have been addressed. Uh, one or more detail in previous discussions as well. So we just want to give you that uh, as an opportunity as a consolidated slide. Next slide, please. And we're almost through. Considering your uh, fiscal and operations, your trending, um, do your trend analysis, do your funding availability, and uh, check and see how working with FISC and operations to do analysis, how you can overcome some of those operational challenges, but just having uh, trend analysis performed because you give it to a numbers person, they come up with a whole nother set of story to help you versus on the programmatic side. So you need to blend that uh, information together. And whereas on the programmatic side, you're less concerned about those. You don't look at those pieces because yours are more tangible on the side dealing with the tenant issues, and you may not have time to perform trend analysis. So work with your people that are number people oriented people that can help you uh, create some trends. Of course, coordination with operations and property staff. If you're a smaller housing authority, you say, hey, I am that person. Yes, you are. You're the jack of all trades. You have to do operations and manage the property at the same time. If you're a larger organization, you most likely have a back office that does some of these functions where you can coordinate move-ins and outs, uh, your wait list and inspection backlogs and coordinate uh, just together as well as uh, finding observations on move outs or abandonments, have your maintenance people, have the tenant, your tenant neighbor. You'd be surprised uh, having community me meetings and say, hey, if you see something reported, let me know. And, and just so we are all together and understand this is our community. And we want to make sure that if we see something, hear something, we can take care of it. So get that foster that kind of camaraderie around uh, the tenants. We're not your enemies. We're here to help you. Uh, the vacancy by bedroom size to match the needs of the, the family that we're housing. Of course, your long-term maintenance plan. Uh, your maintenance plan goes beyond just a regular unit turn. It should be an annual. Anything that leads up to a REAC inspection, you should be doing on a routine from month to month. It should your REAC score should not be a surprise to you. It's only a surprise when you say, I've done everything and you scored high, you say, wow. So <laughs> that's when we take those, but you should know what it takes to pass REAC inspection. Knowing when the job is too large and you need to outsource this or you need more, you need to outsource or you need more people to handle the task. 
recognize that and have a project plan in place to get that done. All right, next slide. All right, interior, what can we do? Best practices. All right, so for that individual that asked earlier, what can we do on interior? We can have um, uh, receive our move out inspection or work order, proceed to apartment. So it's like a checklist. You can change locks, initiate apartment assessments if you use a contractor. Uh, move out all the debris, furniture, empty refrigerator. So these are kind of, um, you know, things that you can coordinate and make sure that you coordinate with the tenant. If the tenant doesn't do it, then that's something that your maintenance staff, uh, of course, has to backfill. And then uh, clean out, of course, all the kitchen cabinets, uh, take out or replace cabinet liner. We don't want to leave that in there. Broom and clean the entire apartment. Maintenance of the entire apartment that includes faucet repair, top and shower. You'd be surprised if you're not looking at the utility bills and the utility consumption, how much a drip can cost you, a drip in the faucet. So you want to make sure that it's always included somewhere, but especially upon um, move outs and cabinets and countertops, making sure your GFCIs, uh, all your aids, if you still have pull aids and things like that, your receptacles, your light switches. Again, having a list that helps you identify uh, quickly and also routine react inspection, what somebody would look at uh, for health and safety concerns, that's what you want to have. You patch all the walls, ceilings for painting, and any other painting on patches that need to occur. But that's kind of really interior should be on the list all the time. Okay, next slide. Exterior, big, big stuff. Uh, check and clean porch areas if you have them. Porch areas, if not the front door. The, of course, cleaning the lights, fixtures, and the, have bulbs, functioning bulbs. These screen doors or doors just in general, are they functioning, are they closing, are they keeping the pests out? The strips that you may need to add. And then, of course, all the windows, damaged and broken glass for exterior. And I know I only highlighted it because in our resources list, we actually give you best practices from the industry where you can actually have access to sample checklists and help expand or create your own checklist. Okay, next slide, please. We're doing a quick poll question before we wrap it up and sum it up. We have four questions only, three of them are yes or no. And the fourth question, again, just very short, one minute, is about a price range for unit term cost because we just want to understand, do you have a robust routine and maintenance plan? Robust, I mean, you really thought of everything, combined everything, including the best practices. In your mind, it always leads to low um, turnover time and you're satisfied with your list? Uh, yes or no question. Do you have a unit turnaround checklist? Do you outsource for unit turns? And what is the average unit turn cost? Now, of course, if you do it internally, it's your staff labor and your materials uh, ballpark, but when you outsource, you know, that's what we're looking at uh, in the current conditions that individuals leave the units. Um, I would not be surprised if it is between uh, $2,500 to $5,000 or greater than $5,000. So quick minute, time is done. And let's see what the results are. All right. Um, some have answered, we have a plan. Many have answered no. So I don't know if that was because of not having enough time to answer the bubble. Um, some answered they have a, uh, a plan a little bit over 1%. You outsource, very little answered. And uh, I see here unit cost primarily between $1,000 and $2,500. So that's the poll question for today. If you did not participate in the poll, I understand we have many no answers, but um, you may not have the answer and that's that's okay too. Next slide, please. Resources. So here, next slide. When you get this PowerPoint in the hot exchange uploaded, these are, this particular slide is for you. Everything that you see underlined is hyperlinked. When you click on that, you will be able to save that onto your computer and your favorites. 
And you see on the fourth bullet, there's a checklist. It's called an apartment turnover cleaning checklist for landlords. It's from Donsters.com. Uh, there is training on improving turnaround, um, vacancy turnarounds, the complete process from a training services association. So there's training on uh, how to better achieve that in the, in the market. And there's a cleaning checklist link, the ultimate rental cleaning checklist. And that came from service master by Zaba.com. If you want to note that down, because you are really working proactively ahead until you, uh, and not waiting until you get access to the slides. And then of course you got the HUD exchange where we will post all the materials and the link is there as well. And this particular series is a series of eight webinars. This is number seven. So July will hold the last session where we kind of put it all together from all the materials. And next slide. Any last questions or comments? If you have them, speak it now. If not, additional questions can be sent to hotcc.trainings, put the S at the end, at IEM.com. Please use the subject line and say PHA occupancy TA post training follow up, important so we can distinguish. Please make sure that your email does reference your name, the housing authority the training topic attended for today, or you can put the date, the specific issue, just be brief, and then an email or phone numbers so that when we have follow-up questions, we can communicate with you and we can make sure that we can address your detailed question that you have. Okay, next slide. That's it, guys. Uh, today is Wednesday, June the 14th. Thank you for your participation today. You could have done many other things, but you chose to be in training today and learn and um, have other resources uh, made or identified available to you. We appreciate you taking that time out. Please share your knowledge. Please make sure you visit HUD Exchange frequently as there's always new training topics. And uh, with that, we are signing off and have a great afternoon. Thank you.